What if I told you that beneath the sprawling modern cityscapes and the timeless deserts, there's another world lurking? A world that thrived when mammoths still roamed and the Sahara was lush with vegetation. It's a world where colossal structures and cities, thought to be younger, were in fact the creations of civilizations lost to us in the mists of prehistory. Today, we're diving deep into the world of submerged cities, signs of catastrophic floods, the ancient Egyptian civilization, and their monuments like the Sphinx and the Pyramids. So, let's embark on this journey through time, unlocking secrets hidden beneath waves and sand dunes. Let's now journey south, along the lifeline of one of the world's greatest civilizations, the Nile. Egypt, the land of the pharaohs, was home to bustling metropolises, temples and cities that are now covered by the waters of the Nile and the Mediterranean. Two of these cities, Thonis, Heraclean and Canopus, were found submerged under Abukir Bay near Alexandria in the late 20th century. Thonis Heraclean, once a prosperous port city, was lost to the world around 1200 years ago. As to what led to its submergence, it's believed that a combination of rising sea levels, land subsidence and possibly a catastrophic event like an earthquake led to its sinking. Imagine walking down the streets of this city, once populated by thousands, now silent except for the occasional sound of aquatic life. The city was discovered in 2000 by a team led by French underwater archaeologist Frank Gordio. They found the ruins spread over 11 kilometers, including 64 ships, 700 anchors, gold coins, weights from Athens, which have never before been found at an Egyptian site, statues standing 16 feet tall, and most notably the remains of a massive temple to the god Amun Gereb. In its glory days, Thonis Heracleion was Egypt's main international trading post, receiving goods from Greece, the Middle East, and other parts of Africa. Nearby, the city of Canopus was also rediscovered, a center for the worship of the god Serapis. The city was known for its temples and pilgrimage sites, attracting people from all corners of the ancient world. The treasures recovered from the site include a perfectly preserved bust of a Ptolemaic queen, grand statues of gods and goddesses, and intricate amulets. Now, let's head over to the iconic Giza Plateau, the site of the Great Sphinx and the Pyramids. These structures are a testament to the grandeur of ancient Egypt, but could they also bear the signs of a great flood? Some researchers believe so. The Sphinx, carved from the bedrock of the Giza Plateau, exhibits a degree of erosion that some geologists argue is consistent with water damage. This is a particularly curious phenomenon given that the Sphinx is located in one of the driest places on Earth. Where could such extensive water damage have come from? This has led to the controversial Sphinx water erosion hypothesis. According to this theory, proposed by individuals like geologist Robert Schoch and author John Anthony West, the erosion on the Sphinx indicates that it was subjected to a prolonged period of heavy rainfall. But there's a twist. The last time Egypt experienced the level of rainfall capable of causing such erosion was at the end of the last ice age around 10,000 BCE, long before the civilization we know as ancient Egypt even began. This theory suggests that the Sphinx and possibly even the pyramids were already standing by the time the first pharaohs took the throne, and the ancient Egyptians merely rediscovered and repurposed these ancient structures. Furthermore, some believe that the pyramids show signs of being submerged underwater at some point, as evident from the presence of fossil shells and petrified wood in and around the pyramids. Uh, again, these are just theories, but they spark a fascinating discussion and provide a fresh perspective on the origins of these mysterious structures. It's a fascinating speculation. Could there be more hidden beneath the vast sands of Egypt, swept under by the relentless waves of a catastrophic flood? Let's explore. Some researchers propose that the uniform layer of silt found across large parts of Egypt could be evidence of a massive flooding event. This layer of silt, often several meters deep, could have resulted from gigantic waves that would have moved vast amounts of sand and silt, potentially burying existing structures. Support for this theory can be found in the studies of sedimentary deposits in the Nile Valley. These deposits indicate instances of rapid short-term increases in the rate of sedimentation, suggestive of a large-scale flooding event. Such an event would have drastically altered the landscape, burying existing structures under meters of sand and sediment. The evidence of tsunami-like events in the Mediterranean basin in the past adds further weight to this theory. 
Some of these tsunamis could have inundated large parts of Egypt's coast, carrying with them sand from the seabed and depositing it far inland. The idea that there could be more pyramids and other structures hidden under Egypt's sands is indeed thought-inducing. Several buried structures have already been discovered in recent years using ground-penetrating radar and other technologies. The potential that there are more secrets to unearth deepens the intrigue of this ancient land. The possibility of a massive flood event having contributed to the reshaping of the landscape opens up new avenues of research and exploration. Egypt, a cradle of human civilization, continues to reveal its past, piece by piece, challenging our understanding of history. We've all heard of the biblical story of Noah's Ark, but the flood narrative isn't unique to Judeo-Christian tradition. From ancient Sumerian tales to Greek mythology to Hindu scriptures, stories of great floods wiping out civilizations and being survived by a handful of individuals are almost universal. So let's plunge into these flood myths and look for evidence. The oldest known flood myth is the Epic of Gilgamesh, originating from ancient Sumer, in which the gods send a flood to wipe out humanity. But one man, Utnapishtim, is warned in advance and builds a great boat to survive. Sound familiar? In Greek mythology, we have the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha, who survive a great deluge sent by Zeus by building a chest. After the flood, they repopulate the earth by throwing stones over their shoulders, which transform into people. The Hindu tradition speaks of a great flood in the story of Manu, the progenitor of mankind. Warned of the impending deluge by a fish, an avatar of the god Vishnu, Manu builds a boat and rescues himself along with the seeds of life to start humanity anew after the floodwaters recede. These myths, scattered across different continents and cultures, all bear striking resemblances to each other, despite being thousands of years old. Could they be retelling the same event? Some researchers believe these myths might be distant, cultural memories of real events, perhaps the flooding at the end of the last ice age when sea levels rose dramatically. Several archaeological sites seem to support this theory. The ancient city of Dwarka, described in Hindu scriptures, was discovered underwater off the coast of modern-day India. Some claim that its submersion aligns with the timeline of the flood described in the story of Manu. In the Mediterranean, evidence of prehistoric settlements was found submerged near the coasts of Greece and Turkey. Were these thriving communities that were swallowed by the sea at the end of the Ice Age? While we need more archaeological and geological evidence to validate these theories, the parallels in these flood myths and their potential connections to submerged archaeological sites make us wonder, could these myths be echoes from a time when sea levels rose, engulfing coastal communities and reshaping our world? The very notion is like a riddle waiting to be solved, a story waiting to be told hidden beneath the waves of our ancient past. Contrary to what we've come to accept about the parched Sahara Desert, the time-worn structures of ancient Egypt tell a different story, an earth-shattering tale that speaks of a time when this arid landscape was a verdant paradise. Let's delve into it. Some researchers believe that the visible water erosion on the Sphinx and the pyramids could indicate that these structures were built during or before a wetter period in Egypt's history. The theory hinges on the existence of unmistakable signs of water erosion, particularly on the Great Sphinx. These erosion patterns do not match the patterns seen on structures known to be built in the dry climate of the last few thousand years. Water erosion on the Sphinx and the pyramids is more consistent with the erosion caused by heavy rainfall than by wind sand erosion. Rainfall of such a magnitude hasn't been seen in the region for many thousands of years, predating the conventional timeline of the Sphinx and the pyramids. This theory has led some to speculate that the Sphinx and the pyramids were constructed during the last humid period in the Sahara, known as the African Humid Period, which ended around 5000 BC. That's several millennia before the accepted timeline for the construction of these monuments. If the water erosion theory is correct, it could radically change our understanding of Egypt's history. A lush, green Egypt, with rivers and forests where we now find sand, dramatically changes the backdrop against which we picture these ancient civilizations. It also paints a vivid picture of how drastically our planet's climate can change over long periods. Ancient Egypt's pyramids continue to draw us in with their grandeur and their complex symbolism. Yet the pyramids might not be the sole achievement of the ancient Egyptians we know today. 
In fact, some theories suggest that they were built by an even older, pre-dynastic civilization, and the Egyptians merely moved in after a catastrophic flood. Egyptology traditionally holds that the pyramids were built around 2600 BCE, primarily as tombs for pharaohs. Yet, some theorists argue that there is evidence to suggest that the pyramids, specifically the Great Pyramid of Giza, were built by a technologically advanced civilization that predates the Egyptians. Architectural elements, such as the precise alignment of the pyramids to true north, their sophisticated understanding of mathematics and geometry, and the construction technique used in building these massive structures, all seem to suggest a level of knowledge that was quite advanced for the time. The Sphinx also adds to this theory. Geological studies on the erosion patterns of the Sphinx suggest that it might have been exposed to thousands of years of rainfall, yet Egypt's arid climate hasn't seen such rain for at least 8,000 years. This has led some to propose that the Sphinx was built by an older civilization that existed during a more temperate climate. The theory of a pre-existing civilization becomes even more intriguing when we consider the flood myths that permeate cultures around the world, including that of the ancient Egyptians. Could it be that the pyramids were built by an advanced civilization that was wiped out by a global flood event only for the structures to be later adopted by the surviving Egyptians? Before we bid adieu, let's take a moment to reflect on what we've explored. If our understanding of history could be so significantly altered by water erosion marks on the Sphinx and the pyramids, or by cities hidden beneath the sea, think of the countless other secrets waiting to be unearthed. What we consider fact today may just be the stepping stone to a more profound truth hidden beneath layers of sand, water and time. So keep asking, keep exploring and remember, the past is a puzzle, a grand sprawling jigsaw that we are only beginning to assemble. Have you ever wondered what secrets are buried beneath the sands of time? Picture this, ancient Egypt, a civilization that left behind architectural wonders like the Sphinx and the pyramids. But what if everything we've been taught about these iconic structures is just a fraction of their true story? Consider the possibility that the pyramids and the Sphinx could be older than the Egyptians themselves that the Sphinx might once have been Anubis, the jackal-headed god, and that the pyramids might contain mathematical marvels and alignments with celestial bodies, intricacies that could suggest a technology or knowledge way beyond the human capability of that era, perhaps pointing towards alien gods. Let's look at the Great Sphinx, a symbol of ancient Egypt that continues to perplex scholars today. The Sphinx is like a silent sentinel, sitting on the Giza Plateau, its weathered face gazing eastward towards the rising sun. But if you examine the Sphinx closely, there are clues in its geology that suggest its story may be more complex than we initially thought. One geologist, Dr. Robert Schock, first brought attention to this in the 90s when he proposed a controversial theory about the Sphinx's age. He noticed that the erosion patterns on the Sphinx appeared to have been caused by water, not just a bit of rain, but thousands of years of heavy rainfall, the kind that hasn't occurred in the Giza region for about 10,000 years since the end of the last ice age. Now, traditional Egyptology places the construction of the Sphinx in the reign of Pharaoh Khafre, around 2500 BCE, when the area was already an arid desert. So where did this water come from? Shoch proposed that the Sphinx may be far older than traditionally believed, dating back to a time when Egypt was a lush tropical landscape with heavy monsoons and flash floods. Of course, the implications of this are profound, shaking the bedrock of our historical understanding. If the Sphinx was weathered by water and this weathering occurred before Egypt became a desert, it would mean that the monument was already ancient by the time the first pharaoh took the throne. It also begs the question, who built it? The civilization capable of such monumental architecture would predate any we know of. Could there be an unknown advanced civilization lost to the sands of time waiting to be discovered? Isn't that what makes history so exciting? The fact that we don't have all the answers yet. Let's now delve into an even more controversial theory surrounding the Sphinx. Now we've all been brought up knowing it as the Sphinx, but what if it wasn't always a lion-bodied, human-headed creature that we see today? What if it was something different? This theory brings us to Robert Temple, a British author and researcher. He proposed a highly debated theory that the Great Sphinx was originally not a Sphinx at all, 
but was instead a massive statue of the jackal god Anubis. Yes, you heard it right. Anubis, the god of embalming and the dead, known for guiding souls in the afterlife. But why Anubis? Temple noted that the current human head of the Sphinx is proportionally much smaller than its body, which could indicate that the head was recarved from a larger original. In this case, a jackal head would fit the larger body better in proportion. Besides, Anubis is typically portrayed as a recumbent canine or a muscular man with a jackal's head, not so far from the Sphinx's current layout. Moreover, there's the location of the Sphinx to consider. It sits in front of the Khafre's pyramid as if it's guarding the entrance to the afterlife, a job usually assigned to Anubis in ancient Egyptian mythology. Could it be that the Sphinx, which literally means living image, was the living image of Anubis instead of the human-headed lion we see today? As you might imagine, this hypothesis has been met with skepticism from mainstream Egyptologists. There are many factors to consider, including the established symbolism of lion-bodied creatures in the ancient world and the absence of any ancient texts referring to the Sphinx as Anubis. Our curiosity is only just getting started. Theories like these challenge the status quo and keep us asking questions. After all, isn't it a bit weird? The awe-inspiring Great Pyramids of Giza are not only remarkable because of their massive scale, but also due to their mathematical precision and alignment. You know, the kind of precision that is surprisingly difficult to achieve even today with all our modern technology and tools. This leads us to ask, how could an ancient civilization accomplish such a feat? Let's start with the Great Pyramid of Giza, also known as the Pyramid of Khufu. It's the largest of the three pyramids, originally standing at an astonishing 481 feet. Not to mention, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world for over 3,800 years, until the completion of Lincoln Cathedral in England in the 14th century. But it's not just about the size. The base of the Great Pyramid is a near-perfect square with each side measuring about 756 feet. The level of precision is such that the difference in lengths between the four sides is less than two inches. Moreover, each side of the pyramid is carefully aligned to one of the cardinal directions, north, south, east and west again with an astoundingly minimal error. This already seems remarkable, right? But hold on to your seats because it's about to get a lot more intriguing. The Pyramid of Khufu, along with the other two pyramids of Giza, are positioned in a way that mirrors the alignment of the three stars in the belt of the constellation Orion. In ancient Egyptian mythology, Orion was associated with the god Osiris, the god of the afterlife. This cosmic correlation suggests a deep understanding of astronomy that goes beyond mere chance. The mathematical sophistication and astronomical alignment present in these pyramids point to a highly advanced civilization. But again, the question remains, how was this accomplished? Mainstream history tells us that this was all done by sheer human ingenuity and labor, using simple tools and methods. Others, however, speculate about intervention from a higher intelligence, perhaps even extraterrestrial. The theories are as vast and intriguing as the pyramids themselves. Isn't it all just amazing? Or maybe it's just a bit weird. There's a saying that goes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If we were to time travel thousands of years back and show a smartphone to the ancient Egyptians, they would likely see it as a divine or magical artifact. With this perspective, some researchers suggest that the pyramids and indeed much of the awe-inspiring accomplishments of ancient Egypt may have been influenced or even directly facilitated by extraterrestrial entities whom the ancients may have perceived as gods. There is a theory known as the ancient astronaut theory that proposes the interaction of extraterrestrial beings with ancient humans. Supporters of this theory suggest that much of the technology, knowledge and spiritual understanding of our ancient civilizations was handed down from these celestial visitors. The idea has gained popularity due to authors like Eric von Däniken and shows like Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. Let's take a closer look at this theory in the context of ancient Egypt. Proponents point out that the construction of the pyramids, especially given the remarkable mathematical precision and astronomical alignments, could not have been possible with the tools and knowledge known to exist during the reign of Pharaoh Khufu. Therefore, they argue, the pyramids might be the result of technology or knowledge provided by an advanced, non-human civilization. Further fueling this theory, 
are the Egyptian texts and artwork that seem to depict what could be interpreted as advanced technology or celestial beings. One example is the hieroglyphs in the Temple of Seti I in Abydos that bear an uncanny resemblance to modern aircrafts. Also, many ancient Egyptian deities were associated with celestial bodies and were believed to possess incredible powers. Could it be that these gods were extraterrestrials, perceived as divine due to their advanced technology and knowledge? Were they the ones who instructed or aided the Egyptians in constructing the pyramids? The Great Pyramid of Giza is not just a testament to the engineering prowess of the ancient Egyptians, it's also an architectural mystery that seems to embed a deep connection to the cosmos. Let's delve into the intriguing details of how the structures on the Giza Plateau reflect an intimate understanding of the heavens, an understanding that seems surprisingly advanced for a civilization from more than 4,000 years ago. It's well known that the layout of the three primary pyramids mirrors the positioning of the stars in Orion's belt. This correlation was brought to the forefront by Robert Boval and Adrian Gilbert in their Orion Correlation Theory. The three stars of Orion's belt, Alnitak, Alnilam and Mintaka, align almost perfectly with the apexes of the three pyramids of Giza. Moreover, the orientation of the pyramids to the north is so precise that it deviates from true north by just 3 slash 60 of a degree. Could the builders have had an advanced astronomical knowledge or perhaps assistance from a more advanced civilization? Going deeper, the Great Pyramid itself has elements of celestial alignment. Its narrow shafts, dubbed air shafts or spirit stones, seem to be aimed at specific stars. The southern shaft of the King's Chamber points to Orion, while the northern shaft points to the circumpolar stars. Similarly, in the Queen's Chamber, one shaft points to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, and another points to the Ursa Minor constellation. It's fascinating to think that these structures built thousands of years ago could act as star pointers. Adding another layer of intrigue, the Sphinx also shows signs of astronomical alignments. The Sphinx faces due east, and some theorists propose that it was designed to observe the equinoxes and solstices. The theory of the Sphinx representing the constellation of Leo during the Age of Leo, approximately 10,500 BCE, as proposed by Robert Boval and Graham Hancock, challenges mainstream chronology and makes us question our understanding of the Sphinx and its origins. While skeptics argue these alignments could be coincidental, it's hard to dismiss the accuracy and precision involved. Could it be a random occurrence or is it evidence of an ancient civilization that had deep astronomical knowledge or perhaps even a sign of extraterrestrial intervention? As we continue to explore and decipher the secrets of ancient Egypt, the questions just keep piling up. And as always, thanks for watching. As we delve into the past, we discover that our history is full of mysteries and questions that even today's technology struggles to answer. From water erosion on the Sphinx to the possibility of Anubis taking its place, from the marvel of mathematical precision in pyramids to the curious celestial alignments, we're left pondering if human hands alone were capable of these feats or if there were other extraterrestrial forces at play. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, one thing is for sure. The more we explore, the more fascinating our world becomes. Until next time. Did you know that beneath the swirling waters of the Mediterranean lies a city that was once the grandest port of the ancient world, its splendor now hidden beneath the waves? Today, we're diving deep into the mysterious and captivating world of Thonis Heracleion, Egypt's sunken city. Through its rise and fall, from being an emblem of prosperity to a submerged testament of time, Thonis Heracleion whispers tales that challenge our understanding of history, culture, and human achievement. So let's embark on this journey where we'll not only unmask the past, but also explore how the future of archaeological exploration is set to unfold. Today we're diving deep into the story of Thonis Heracleion, a city that once stood proud but now resides beneath the waves. But what if I told you that this submerged city was once one of the grandest in the world? Yes, let's rewind back a few millennia to the days when Thonis Heracleion was at its peak. In the time of its glory, around the 8th to the 2nd century BCE, Thonis Heracleion wasn't just a city. It was one of Egypt's most important commercial hubs and port of entry for trade with the Mediterranean. This wasn't just a backwater outpost, it was a bustling, vibrant city filled with grand temples, trading posts and residential areas. Picture this, giant statues of pharaohs and gods adorning the public spaces, stately stone steles inscribed with royal decrees, 
vessels filled with goods from Greece and beyond arriving at the city's harbor, priests performing religious rituals at grand temples like the one dedicated to the god Amun Gereb, the supreme god of the Egyptians at the time. In many ways, Thonis Heraklion was a microcosm of the ancient world's interconnectivity. The city's strategic position near the mouth of the Nile made it a key trading hub between the Mediterranean and the Nile Delta. This wasn't just a place where goods were exchanged, it was a place where cultures, ideas and traditions intermingled. But it wasn't just about trade. Thonis Heraklion also had a spiritual significance. According to Herodotus, the city was where the hero Heracles first set foot on Egypt, and where Helen of Troy and her lover Paris sought refuge. This added a layer of myth and legend to the city's bustling trade and vibrant life. And while this paints a vivid picture of a thriving city, all this grandeur, all these tales and legends, all these monuments to human achievement would eventually sink beneath the waves. But what happened? Why did such a vital city disappear from history only to be discovered underwater centuries later? But how does a city go from being one of the most influential in the ancient world to resting beneath the sea? Well, as they say, nothing lasts forever. When Thonis Heracleion fell, it was quite literally, but why? What caused this great city to disappear into the depths of the Mediterranean? The answer, as is often the case, lies in a combination of natural and human-induced factors. Researchers believe that the city's downfall was mainly due to geological and climatic changes. Thonis Heracleion was built on the Nile Delta's unstable sediments, which are vulnerable to liquefaction. This process turns seemingly solid ground into a flowing liquid state, a bit like quicksand. Now imagine large buildings, statues and a growing population pressing down on this land. Meanwhile, the sea level was rising, not rapidly but consistently year after year. The combined weight and geological instability were ticking time bombs. Now, add to this some catastrophic natural events. It's believed that a series of earth tremors and tsunamis hit the region around the time of Thonis Heracleion's decline. Gradually, over decades or perhaps a few short centuries, the city began sinking into the sea, buildings collapsed, streets flooded, and, bit by bit, Thonis Heracleion was claimed by the Mediterranean. But here's the twist, while the city was slowly sinking, people didn't just abandon it. The inhabitants tried to adapt, to build over the sinking ruins to keep their city alive. But ultimately, nature had the final say. By the end of the 2nd century BCE, most of Thonis Heracleion had sunk beneath the sea. Alexandria, another city founded by Alexander the Great, took over as Egypt's premier port, and Thonis Heracleion gradually faded from collective memory. It wasn't until the beginning of the 21st century that the submerged city was rediscovered and brought back into the limelight, a tale we will explore in our next segment. It's easy to forget, but our past is always beneath our feet and sometimes beneath the waves. The city of Thonis Heracleion disappeared from our collective memory until the turn of the 21st century, when our narrative takes an exciting turn. We transition from history to a more modern tale of adventure and rediscovery, similar to an Indiana Jones movie but underwater. Enter French underwater archaeologist Frank Gaudio. In 2000, Godio, supported by his team from the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology, embarked on an expedition to unravel a mystery that had remained unsolved for centuries. Armed with ancient texts and cutting-edge technology, Godio searched the seabed of Abukir Bay off the coast of Egypt. What he discovered was beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Over the course of many years, his team methodically uncovered the remnants of Thonis Heracleion. Giant statues, gold coins, staley inscribed with ancient Greek and Egyptian scripts, pottery, jewelry and even shipwrecks emerged from the silt-covered seabed. But perhaps the most significant find was a huge stone slab known as the Decree of Sais, which helped to confirm beyond doubt that this was indeed the lost city of Thonis Heracleion. But imagine the difficulty of this task. Imagine being an archaeologist, but your worksite is under several meters of water, and your historical treasures are buried under centuries of silt and sediment. It's a painstaking process, moving centimeter by centimeter, careful not to destroy the fragile relics of the past. Every object brought to the surface was meticulously documented and conserved. 
Many of these artifacts are now exhibited in museums around the world, providing us with a tangible connection to this lost city and its intriguing past. It's incredible to think that a city once so vibrant and influential could be forgotten, only to be rediscovered millennia later. Now let's venture a little deeper into the world of underwater archaeology, which plays a crucial role in unlocking the mysteries of submerged cities like Thonis Heracleion. This is no easy task, mind you. In fact, the challenges of underwater archaeology are as deep and complex as the oceans themselves. Firstly, we have the obstacle of depth. The deeper an archaeological site, the greater the pressure, the colder the temperature, and the darker it gets. These harsh conditions limit the amount of time divers can spend underwater and impair their ability to see and move, thus complicating excavation efforts. Then, there's the issue of sediment. Over centuries, sunken cities become buried under layers of sand and silt, obscuring them from view. Unlike digging on land, removing sediment underwater creates clouds of debris that reduce visibility and can potentially damage delicate artifacts. Furthermore, marine archaeology demands a comprehensive and interdisciplinary approach, combining the principles of archaeology, oceanography, marine biology, and engineering, among others. Excavation techniques must also be adapted to handle artifacts that have been immersed in water for centuries, as these objects can be extremely fragile and can disintegrate if not handled with extreme care. Equipment and technology pose another challenge. Underwater archaeology relies heavily on advanced tools such as remotely operated vehicles ROVs, sonar mapping systems and specialized diving equipment. But these technologies are expensive and require specialized training to operate. Lastly, we can't ignore the conservation challenge. Once artifacts are brought to the surface, they must undergo extensive and often costly conservation work to prevent them from degrading in the air. This involves removing salts and other corrosive agents, carefully drying the artifacts and preserving them for further study and display. But why do we go to such lengths? Because every challenge overcome, every artifact unearthed is another piece in the jigsaw puzzle of our past. And as we've seen with the discovery and ongoing exploration of Thonis Heracleion, the results can be astonishing, opening up new windows into ancient civilizations and their untold stories. In the end, despite all the hardships and complexities, the quest to unravel the mysteries hidden beneath the waves continues. Because just as Michelangelo once said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free, underwater archaeologists see the whispers of history in the deep blue and dive until they set them free. As we delve into the future of Thonis Heracleion, we find ourselves face to face with a combination of excitement, anticipation and concern. Yes, the journey of discovery isn't over yet. In fact, one might say it has just begun. The current body of knowledge we have about Thonis Heracleion is like a puzzle with many missing pieces. Each dive, each excavation, promises the potential discovery of new artifacts that could help us form a more complete picture of this ancient city. However, the future isn't just about uncovering what lies beneath. New technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D modeling can play a significant role in bringing the story of Thonis Heracleion to a broader audience. Imagine strapping on a virtual reality headset and walking through the ancient streets of Thonis Heracleion, seeing the buildings, the artifacts, and the people as they were thousands of years ago. Isn't that mind-boggling? Yet, while we dream of digital recreations and archaeological revelations, there is an urgent concern that looms large. The threat of climate change, Rising sea levels, warming oceans, and extreme weather events pose serious risks to underwater archaeological sites. These impacts can accelerate the degradation of artifacts and structures, and even make some sites inaccessible for study. This urgency further underlines the need for continued exploration and preservation efforts. There's an ongoing debate about whether we should leave artifacts in situ, preserving them underwater, or bring them to the surface for study and conservation. As technology advances, we might be able to do both, explore and conserve the site underwater while also digitally documenting and replicating the finds for study and display. And there you have it. From the glories of its heyday to the mysteries shrouding its decline, the story of Thonis Heracleion is indeed a fascinating saga. Its rediscovery not only gives us a glimpse into an era long gone, but also presents us with opportunities to revolutionize how we perceive and preserve our past. As we look towards the future, 
it's clear that the tale of Thonis Heracleon is far from over. With advancing technology and undying human curiosity, we stand at the brink of even more groundbreaking discoveries. So, as we bid adieu to the sunken city of Thonis Heracleon for now, remember, what if I told you that beneath the shimmering waves of the Indian Ocean, there lies a submerged city that just might be a legendary kingdom mentioned in an ancient epic? Yes, we're going on a deep dive into the story of Dwarka, a city described in the Mahabharata, one of the major Sanskrit epics of ancient India. This isn't just an exploration of myth and legend, but also a journey through the fascinating realms of underwater archaeology and radiocarbon dating. So let's plunge into the depths and discover the captivating saga of Dwarka. Dwarka is more than just a name. It's a word that translates to the gateway to heaven. According to Hindu mythology, this majestic city was established by none other than Lord Krishna, a deity worshipped as the eighth avatar of Lord Vishnu. Now, who is Krishna, you might ask? Krishna, a central figure in Hinduism, is widely revered for his wisdom, his strategic prowess, his supernatural feats, and his role as a charioteer, advisor, and friend to Prince Arjuna in the epic Mahabharata. In this ancient text, Krishna flees to the western coast of India after a catastrophic war. Here he establishes the city of Dwarka, a city so opulent and grand that it's often described as a city made of gold. But as stories go, this magnificent city meets a tragic end. After Krishna's death, a series of calamities strike. Submerged by the sea in a matter of days, the city disappears, taking all its architectural grandeur and wealth along with it. The tale of Dwarka is fascinating in its own right, but here's where it gets even more interesting. This myth aligns with a geological phenomenon known as sea level rise, which could result in the submergence of coastal settlements. So this begs the question, is Dwarka just a symbolic tale or could it be an actual historical event dressed in myth and legend? The archaeology unit of the National Institute of Oceanography is making headlines. The team is embarking on an underwater archaeological expedition to see what lies beneath the sea at Dwarka, on the western coast of India. Led by archaeologists S.R. Rao and As Gaur, the team discovers something that shakes up the world of archaeology. Structural remains and artifacts suggesting the existence of an ancient city. The expedition reveals well-planned stone structures, pottery shards, semi-precious stones and inscriptions, some of which date back to the Harappan civilization around 2000 BCE. The discoveries don't stop there. Subsequent underwater explorations reveal an extensive network of stone structures, extending over half a mile, which appears to have been built on the bank of an ancient river, the Gomati. The stone structures, ceramics and inscriptions lend credibility to the existence of a bustling urban centre in antiquity. It's an intriguing find, right? But there's a twist. The artifacts and structures found underwater not only suggest the existence of an ancient city, but also hint at a city that may have been submerged by rising sea levels, aligning strikingly with the legend of Dwarka. Could it be that the legend of Dwarka was not merely a legend, but a page out of our own historical past preserved in mythology? So we have established that there's something under the sea at Dwarka, but what exactly did the explorers find? Well, the discoveries at Dwarka were nothing short of astonishing. Firstly, pottery shards were found in abundance. These pieces of ancient ceramics were from a variety of different eras, some of them dating back to the late Harappan period. The variety in pottery styles suggests that Dwarka was inhabited over an extensive period of time, housing several generations of people. Then there were the semi-precious stones. These materials, often used for making jewellery, speak volumes about the economic prosperity of the city. The presence of such materials suggests that Dwarka was a trade center, exchanging goods with different parts of the ancient world. Next, there were the inscriptions. The most important of these was a seal that bore the image of a three-headed animal. The symbolism behind this creature remains a mystery, but the very fact that the inhabitants of Dwarka had a complex system of symbols suggests a sophisticated society, and then, of course, there were the architectural remains. Stone structures of various shapes and sizes were found, giving archaeologists a glimpse into the layout of the city. Among these structures, a series of circular fort-like constructions, believed to be part of the city's defense system, were particularly remarkable. 
Taken together, these discoveries form a remarkable narrative of an ancient city that was, in its time, a hub of civilization and commerce. And this narrative, much to our astonishment, aligns remarkably well with the mythical city of Dwarka described in the Mahabharata. In a world where we want hard facts, the science of radiocarbon dating can act as our time machine, providing an objective lens through which to view the past. And it was this scientific tool that was used to try and pinpoint the age of the submerged city of Dwarka. Radiocarbon dating works by estimating the age of organic materials, which include ancient artifacts and biological specimens. It's based on the principle that all living things contain carbon, some of which is radioactive C14. When a creature or plant dies, it stops absorbing this radioactive carbon, but the C14 it already contains continues to decay. By measuring the remaining quantity of C14, scientists can estimate how long ago the organism died, or in our case, when the artifacts were last used or made. Applying this technique, pieces of wood from Dwarka were sent to laboratories where they were analyzed for radiocarbon content. The results? The wood samples were found to date back to around 7,500 years ago, vastly predating the expected timeline of Mahabharata, according to most historians. This significant revelation opened up a Pandora's box of questions. Could the submerged city really be the mythical Dwarka? If so, does it mean that our timeline of the Mahabharata is off? Or does it suggest that the city was inhabited long before Krishna supposedly ruled there and the epic merely borrowed the location's rich history? The radiocarbon dating results were a fascinating discovery, adding a new layer of complexity to the mystery of Dwarka. It reminds us that the lines between history, archaeology and mythology can blur, leaving us to ponder on the intersection of fact and fiction. How does radiocarbon dating work? Let's step back from the Dwarka and elaborate a little more on this interesting way to measure age. Alright, so imagine you're watching a video on YouTube. When the video starts, it's fully loaded, right? Now let's say you pause the video and go grab a snack. When you come back, you notice that the video has unloaded a bit. It's been buffering and you can't play it right away. That's a bit like how radiocarbon dating works. But instead of a video, we're talking about a kind of stuff called carbon-14. You see, everything that was once alive, like a tree, a dinosaur, or a woolly mammoth, absorbed a type of carbon called carbon-14 when they were living. Once they die, they stop taking in new carbon-14. But here's the cool part. Carbon-14 is a little bit like a slowly buffering YouTube video. Over time, it changes or decays into another kind of stuff called nitrogen-14. Scientists call the time it takes for half of the carbon-14 to change into nitrogen-14. It's half-life, kind of like if half your video had to buffer before you could watch it. For carbon-14, this half-life is about 5,730 years. Now let's say we find a really old piece of wood and we want to know when the tree it came from stopped living. We can't ask the tree, obviously, but we can use a special tool to measure how much carbon-14 is still in the wood compared to how much carbon-12 a type of carbon that doesn't change over time, is in it. If there's a lot of carbon-14 left, the tree probably hasn't been dead very long, but if there's only a little carbon-14 left, that means the tree has been dead for a very long time, and that's pretty much how radiocarbon dating works. Scientists use this method to tell how old things are that used to be alive, from ancient wooden tools to prehistoric animal bones. It's like a time machine that helps us uncover the secrets of the past, the discussion surrounding the ancient city of Dwarka isn't without its skeptics. These are the people who question the conclusions that have been drawn from the archaeological evidence, and their doubts are an important part of the scientific process. One of the main areas of skepticism revolves around the age of the underwater city. Critics point out that while certain samples tested using radiocarbon dating suggest an older date, this doesn't necessarily confirm that the city itself is of the same age. In other words, older organic material could have been incorporated into a younger settlement. Skeptics also point to the complexity and size of the structures that have been found underwater. They argue that these structures are far more sophisticated than what is typically associated with other sites from the same period. Some even suggest that the underwater ruins could be the remnants of a much more recent settlement, potentially even dating to medieval times. Then there's the question of the city's connection to the ancient epic, the Mahabharata. Skeptics argue that just because a city is found where the mythical Dwarka is said to have been, doesn't mean it's the same city. 
After all, there could have been multiple settlements in the area over the thousands of years of human history. Finally, skeptics argue that more research needs to be done. The underwater site is extensive, and only a small portion has been thoroughly investigated. Until more of the city is explored and more artifacts are found and tested, skeptics caution against drawing firm conclusions about the site's age and cultural significance. But where does that leave us? A submerged city, radiocarbon dates that point to immense antiquity, and a saga that may or may not be the echoes of a distant past. The quest for understanding Duarca is a testament to the human spirit's insatiable curiosity, bridging the gap between myth and science. So the next time you gaze at the vast expanse of the ocean, remember that beneath its surface may lie stories waiting to be discovered. But as always, the journey towards knowledge is as fascinating as the destination itself. There's a bridge nestled in the midst of swirling waters between India and Sri Lanka. But this isn't just any bridge, it's a bridge wrapped in mystery, legend and intrigue. Its name is Rama Setu or Adams Bridge. This 30-kilometer stretch of limestone shoals has been the star of countless myths, scientific studies and even UFO theories. Could this be the very bridge built by an army of monkeys for the Hindu god Rama? Or is it simply a geological formation sculpted by the hands of time? From radiocarbon dating to satellite imagery and ancient texts, let's embark on a journey to uncover the truth behind this fascinating structure. Adams Bridge, as it's alternatively known, isn't just a mythical construct. It's a tangible feature on our planet's surface, viewable even from satellite images. Spanning around 30 kilometers, this chain of limestone shoals extends from the southeastern coast of India, the Ramswaram Island, to Sri Lanka's northwestern coast, ending at the Manor Island. But what exactly is it, and how did it form? Let's venture into the fascinating realm of geology to comprehend this wonder. Adams Bridge, in the scientific perspective, is often explained as a natural geological formation, possibly a tombolo or a chain of barrier islands and shallow sandbanks formed by sedimentation and tidal actions over thousands of years. It's primarily composed of a series of parallel ledges of sand and limestone, patched up with boulders that appear to be randomly dispersed along its length. Scientists speculate that this geological formation was the result of a process called spit formation in the marine environment. A spit is a narrow strip of land that juts out into the sea from the coastline. It's formed by the longshore drift, a process where the waves hit the coast at an oblique angle, moving the sand or sediment down the coastline. Over millennia, this longshore drift could have built up a pathway connecting the two land masses. Fluctuations in sea levels due to natural climate changes or tectonic activities could have alternately exposed and submerged these sandbanks, creating the chain of islets we see today. But this isn't the only scientific theory. Some researchers propose that the bridge could be the remnant of a former land connection between India and Sri Lanka, dating back to an ice age when sea levels were considerably lower. As the ice melted with the change in Earth's climate, the sea levels rose, isolating Sri Lanka from the Indian mainland but leaving behind this mysterious link, a mute witness to Earth's eventful past. Whether it's the result of spit formation or a relic from the last ice age, the scientific perspective on Adams Bridge brings to light the complex and dynamic nature of Earth's geology and our continuous journey in understanding it. Ah, UFOs, unidentified flying objects, a staple of the mysterious and unexplained. A theory, perhaps the most sensational of all, has emerged suggesting that Rama Setu or Adam's Bridge wasn't built by humans or natural processes, but by extraterrestrial beings. While this may sound far-fetched to many, it's important to remember that we're in the realm of the unexplained, where sometimes the extraordinary is the norm. The UFO theory draws on several different strands of reasoning. First, there is the sheer scale and complexity of the bridge itself. According to the Ramayana, the bridge was built in just five days by a team of monkey-like beings known as the Vanara, using stones that floated on water. To skeptics, this description seems impossible, if not miraculous. Could it be, they ask, that the Vanara were in fact alien beings with technologies far beyond our comprehension? Another point in favor of the UFO theory is the precision of the construction. The bridge is made of a chain of limestone shoals that are lined up almost perfectly straight over an 18-mile span. 
This degree of accuracy, some argue, suggests advanced technology and planning that might have been beyond human capabilities at the time. Lastly, the UFO theory supporters often bring up the ancient astronaut hypothesis. This line of thinking suggests that extraterrestrials visited Earth in the distant past and had significant interactions with early human civilizations, possibly even aiding in the creation of monumental structures like the pyramids of Egypt, Stonehenge and perhaps Rama Setu. Of course, it's crucial to note that while fascinating, the UFO theory remains just that, a theory. It's one of many possible explanations and currently there is no concrete scientific evidence to support it. But as we continue to explore our past, who knows what astonishing revelations the sands of time may yet reveal. This is what keeps the mystery of Adam's Bridge alive and intriguing. Ramasetu, known in the Hindu tradition, is an extraordinary example of how the spiritual world blends with the physical. As its name suggests, it's named after Lord Rama, a major deity in Hinduism and a central character in the epic poem, the Ramayana. But this isn't just any bridge. The myth suggests it was constructed by a legion of monkeys, led by the bear king Jambavan and the monkey generals Nala and Nila, all in the service of Lord Rama. According to the Ramayana, Rama's wife Sita was kidnapped by the demon king Ravana and taken to his kingdom in Lanka, modern-day Sri Lanka. To rescue her, Rama needed a way to cross the vast ocean that separated India from Lanka. The solution? This bridge, constructed from floating stones, was said to be inscribed with Rama's name by the monkey army, causing them to float and form the bridge. This entire endeavor was overseen by Rama and his loyal devotee, the monkey god Hanuman. What's more fascinating about this myth is the representation of the bridge in various forms of Indian art, literature and theater. It signifies the victory of good over evil, the power of faith and the strength of unity. It isn't merely a physical bridge in these narratives, but a metaphorical one, representing the journey of self-realization, overcoming obstacles, and the path towards enlightenment. Whether or not you believe in the mythical story, the existence of the bridge has compelled many to reflect on the narrative's metaphorical implications. The bridge, through its connection to Lord Rima, represents a tangible manifestation of the epic story that has been a part of Indian culture for thousands of years. The myth of the Rama Setu continues to be deeply ingrained in the collective consciousness of the people, standing as a symbol of their rich and diverse mythological heritage. Radiocarbon dating and geological studies offer us the tools to peer into the past, providing empirical data that we can use to corroborate or challenge existing myths and legends. With Ramasetu or Adams Bridge, these scientific investigations are particularly crucial, given the cultural, historical and mythical importance of the site. Radiocarbon dating, also known as carbon-14 dating, is a method used by scientists to determine the age of organic material. This technique relies on the fact that carbon-14, an isotope of carbon, is constantly created in the atmosphere due to cosmic radiation and is absorbed by living organisms. When an organism dies, it stops absorbing carbon-14, which then begins to decay at a known rate. By measuring the amount of carbon-14 left in a sample, scientists can estimate when the organism died, and consequently, when it was last active. Some studies carried out on samples from Adams Bridge have suggested that the formation could be about 7,000 years old. These findings, if validated, could suggest that the bridge predates most known early human civilizations, adding an intriguing layer to its mystery. Apart from radiocarbon dating, geological studies also play an important role in understanding Adams Bridge. Geological assessments of the area indicate that the bridge might have been above sea level until it was broken by a rise in sea levels a few thousand years ago. Some scientists believe that the cyclical rises and falls in sea levels, caused by ice ages and interglacial periods, could have exposed and hidden the bridge multiple times over hundreds of thousands of years. The combination of these scientific methods offers us a way to piece together a factual narrative of Adam's bridge, albeit with some gaps and uncertainties. It is in these gaps where myth, history and science intermingle, sparking debates, theories and endless fascination. This complex interplay between different facets of knowledge underscores our collective quest to understand our shared heritage and the mysteries that time has veiled. Much like every other structure that has withstood the harsh and relentless test of time, Ramasetu too has faced significant deterioration. 
the exact causes behind its present condition are as multifaceted and complex as the structure itself. First, we must consider natural causes. The bridge is primarily made up of sand and stones, materials that are inherently susceptible to erosion. Over thousands of years, the ceaseless pounding by the sea would have slowly but steadily worn down the structure, causing parts of it to collapse. This is a natural occurrence that affects all coastal structures and landscapes, not just Ramasetu. The fact that the structure still exists today is a testament to the robustness of its original construction. Secondly, rising sea levels also have a crucial role to play. Over the centuries, global sea levels have fluctuated due to various climate changes. In periods of significant sea level rise, more of the bridge would have been submerged, leading to increased erosion and the potential collapse of parts of the structure. Thirdly, we should not discount human activity. The area around Ramasetu has been a busy maritime route for centuries. Ship traffic, dredging activities and the general human interference could have potentially accelerated the bridge's deterioration. Lastly, the region's seismic activity also deserves mention. South Asia is a seismically active region, and over the millennia, earthquakes could have altered the structure, causing parts of it to sink or collapse. In the grand scheme of things, the question isn't really why Rama Setu has deteriorated, but rather how it has managed to survive so long despite these numerous challenges. This conundrum adds another layer of intrigue to the enduring mystery of this ancient bridge. It's been a roller coaster ride through a maze of myths, science, skepticism, and even out of this world theories. The enigma of Ramasetu or Adam's Bridge reminds us of our timeless quest to understand our past and the answers that still elude us. Despite the erosion, rising sea levels, seismic activities and human interference, the fact that this bridge has endured the trials of time is itself a testament to the enigmatic wonder it beholds. Until our next adventure into the labyrinth of the known and unknown, remember, the universe never ceases to amaze. Water covers over 70% of Earth's surface, and beneath the waves lie mysteries and marvels waiting to be explored. But what have we found so far, and what might still be hiding? Today, we'll dive into the most mysterious things found underwater. Underwater cities have long captivated our imagination, sparking curiosity, excitement, and a sense of mystery. The concept has often been associated with mythical places like Atlantis, but as technology advances and underwater archaeology flourishes, real submerged cities have emerged from the depths, challenging our understanding of human history. One of the most intriguing underwater cities is the ancient city of Heracleion, also known as Thonis, off Egypt's coast. Once a vibrant trading port, it sank around 1,200 years ago, Discovered in 2000 by French archaeologist Frank Godio, Heracleion revealed temples, statues, and artifacts, providing an unprecedented glimpse into ancient Egyptian civilization. The reasons for its sinking remain debated, with theories ranging from earthquakes to soil liquefaction. In Japan, near Yonaguni Island, an enigmatic underwater structure has stirred controversy. Some believe the Yonaguni monument to be the remnants of a long-lost city, with its sharply defined steps and terraces. Others argue that it's a natural geological formation. Divers and researchers continue to explore the site, seeking to unravel its secrets. The underwater city of Dwarka in India is another captivating find. Linked to the epic Mahabharata, it's said to be the legendary city of Lord Krishna. Archaeological discoveries of sunken structures dating back thousands of years add credence to the mythological accounts, connecting ancient texts with tangible evidence. China's Chandao Lake hides an extraordinary sunken city known as Xicheng, or Lion City. Submerged in 1959 during the creation of a reservoir, the city remains remarkably preserved. Its intricate wooden structures and carvings represent a time capsule of Chinese history, offering a view into architectural practices dating back centuries. Sunken ships have fascinated historians, archaeologists and adventurers alike for centuries. These vessels, once symbols of human ingenuity, exploration and commerce, now rest in the depths, silent witnesses to different epochs and forgotten battles. Among the most well-known sunken ships is the RMS Titanic, a symbol of human ambition and tragedy. When it struck an iceberg on its maiden voyage in 1912, it became an enduring legend. Explorations of the wreckage have uncovered everything from fine china to personal belongings, 
each piece telling a poignant story of the lives lost and the era's social norms. The Swedish warship Vasa is another notable example. Sunk in 1628 on its maiden voyage, it was an engineering failure that embarrassed the Swedish monarchy. In 1961, the ship was remarkably well preserved when recovered from Stockholm's harbour. Today, it's housed in a museum offering an intimate view of 17th century naval warfare and shipbuilding. Sunken pirate ships also stir our imagination with treasures and tales of high sea adventures. The wider galley, a pirate ship that sank in 1717 off the coast of Cape Cod, has yielded a trove of artifacts from cannons to gold coins. Its discovery brought to life colorful characters like Black Sam Bellamy and illuminated the golden age of piracy. The exploration of warships from world wars offers unique historical insights. For example, the wreck of the German battleship Bismarck, which sank in 1941 after a relentless pursuit by the British Royal Navy, is a somber reminder of naval warfare's complexity and destruction. Its discovery in 1989 added crucial details to wartime narratives. Sunken ships also reveal information about ancient trade routes and societies. The Uluburun shipwreck, dating back to the 14th century BCE, found off the coast of Turkey, contained a rich cargo of precious metals, ivory, and artifacts from as far as Afghanistan. It provides an astonishing view of the far-reaching connections in the ancient world. The Bimini Road, also known as the Bimini Wall, is a fascinating underwater formation located near North Bimini Island in the Bahamas. This enigmatic site consists of a series of rectangular and sub-rectangular limestone blocks forming what appears to be a road or wall beneath the clear Caribbean waters. Discovered in 1968 by underwater explorer Joseph Manson Valentine and his team, the Bimini Road quickly captured the public's imagination. Many saw in it echoes of the ancient, mythical city of Atlantis, and the formation's alignment and geometric patterns led some to propose that it was a man-made structure, possibly a road, temple, or dock. However, geological studies have since suggested that the formation is likely a natural occurrence. The blocks are composed of beach rock, a natural limestone composite that often fractures in straight lines. These studies propose that the Bimini Roads formation resulted from the fracturing and subsidence of this beach rock over thousands of years, but not everyone is convinced by this explanation. Some researchers and explorers point to what they see as two perfect alignments and unusual features such as seemingly cut and fitted stones as evidence of human intervention. The site's proximity to other Caribbean archaeological sites adds fuel to this perspective. The debate over the Bimini Road's origin has made it a favorite destination for divers, scholars, and Atlantis enthusiasts. Its mysterious nature continues to inspire books, documentaries, and theories, each exploring different aspects of its potential significance. In addition to its possible historical or mythical connections, the Bimini Road and its surrounding waters are home to diverse marine life. The blocks and crevices form a natural reef environment that supports a rich ecosystem of fish, corals, and other marine organisms. Underwater crop circles are mysterious patterns found on the ocean floor that have intrigued scientists, divers, and enthusiasts for years. These intricate formations, primarily discovered in the coastal waters of Japan, are remarkable for their geometric precision and complexity. The discovery of underwater crop circles began in the 1990s when divers first encountered these strange symmetrical designs in the shallow seabeds. The circles, often measuring up to seven feet in diameter, are composed of intricately ridged sand patterns and are often surrounded by carefully arranged shells and debris. Theories and speculations about their origin abounded. Some initially thought these patterns were created by natural phenomena like currents, or even underwater earthquakes. Others speculated about extraterrestrial involvement or unknown underwater creatures crafting these fascinating designs. However, the true architects of these underwater marvels were eventually discovered to be small, unassuming pufferfish. Males of a particular species of pufferfish were observed crafting these intricate patterns on the ocean floor as part of a mating ritual. The male pufferfish uses its fins to carefully carve the designs, spending several days creating and perfecting the circle. The more symmetrical and elaborate the pattern, the more attractive it is to potential mates. Researchers found that the central, nest-like portion of the pattern serves as a mating site, 
while the outer ridges and patterns play a role in both attracting females and providing a buffer against ocean currents. The shells and debris incorporated into the designs are thought to provide nourishment to the eggs and newly hatched offspring. The Baltic Sea Anomaly is a mysterious underwater object discovered in June 2011 by the OceanX diving team while exploring the depths of the northern Baltic Sea. This enigmatic finding located on the seafloor about 300 feet below the surface has captured imaginations and spurred debates worldwide. The object is a 200 foot wide, roughly circular formation, with an appearance resembling a flat, unusually shaped rock or even a crashed UFO as some have described it. The anomaly sits at the end of what appears to be a nearly 1,000 foot long runway or skid path, further adding to the intrigue. Upon discovery, the anomaly's unique and unexplainable shape led to wild speculation. Was it a geological formation, a sunken city, an ancient temple, or perhaps even evidence of extraterrestrial visitors? The speculation was fueled by initial sonar images, which revealed a seemingly artificial angular structure, unlike typical natural formations found underwater. Some researchers have proposed that the Baltic Sea anomaly could be a natural geological formation such as a glacial deposit shaped by the Ice Age's retreating glaciers. Others have suggested it could be the remnants of an ancient construction or perhaps even a sunken World War II-era anti-submarine device. Despite various expeditions to the site, conclusive evidence about the anomaly's nature remains elusive. Divers and scientists who have explored the site report unusual disturbances in electrical equipment near the object, further deepening the mystery. Attempts to date the object have also provided conflicting results. Some samples taken from the site suggest an age of up to 140,000 years, which would rule out any human-made structure. Other theories point to its formation during the Ice Age, aligning it with natural geological processes. The Baltic Sea anomaly continues to be a subject of fascination and investigation. The mixture of tangible evidence, unclear origin and tantalizing theories keeps this underwater enigma firmly in the spotlight of both scientific and popular exploration. The lost city of Cuba is one of the most puzzling underwater mysteries of our time. In 2001, a team of Canadian and Cuban researchers discovered a series of strange stone formations off the coast of the Guanajaca Bibes Peninsula in Cuba. These formations lie at depths of around 2,000 feet, far deeper than any known ancient human-made structures. The mysterious underwater city comprises symmetrical and geometric formations that appear to be organized in a deliberate urban-like pattern. Some of the structures resemble pyramids, others look like circular buildings, and there are even what seem to be roads and tunnels. The formations cover an area of nearly two square miles, and some individual structures are as large as 400 meters wide. The discovery sparked widespread interest and intrigue. Could this be the remains of a once great city, now submerged and lost to time? Some even speculated that the site might be the remnants of the mythical city of Atlantis, or perhaps a sunken city from a previously unknown ancient civilization. Initial explorations by remotely operated vehicles revealed compelling details, such as the intricate designs carved into the rocks, further suggesting an artificial origin. However, the extreme depth of the site and the technical challenges associated with exploring it have made comprehensive investigation difficult. Skeptics argue that the formations might be natural and that the apparent symmetry and organization are merely coincidental. Some geological theories propose that the formations are the result of slow natural processes that have shaped the stones over millennia. They point to similar naturally occurring underwater formations around the world as evidence. Despite these counter-arguments, the evidence is not clear-cut. The site's sheer complexity and the enigmatic features captured in sonar images keep the possibility of a human-made origin alive. Some researchers believe that the site could have been above water more than 50,000 years ago, during the last ice age, making human habitation theoretically possible. And as always, I hope you enjoyed our video today. Thanks for watching.